Hey guys, you're probably already familiar with the two flavors of programming languages, namely interpreted and compiled. You are probably told that an interpreted language, like Python, has an interpreter which takes in your source code and executes it immediately, whereas a compiled language like C has a compiler which compiles your source code to a native executable which you can easily run. Unfortunately, the compiler part of this explanation is wrong. Well, it's not completely wrong, but there are some oversimplifications in there which can cause some confusion. So what oversimplifications are there then? Well, first of all, the compiler doesn't do everything. There's actually two steps going on when converting a source file to an executable. The first part is where the source file is compiled via the compiler to intermediate files called object files. All of these object files are passed on to the linker, which links them all together into an executable. So, source code to executable is not just one step, but two separate steps, and this distinction helps understand how programs can be structured or how libraries can be used in compiled languages like C and C++. So let's get into the nitty gritty. First of all, notice that the compiler works on every source file completely separately to output completely separate object files. Let's take an example with a very simple hello world C file and another equally as simple foo.c file. It just contains the definition of a function called foo. I think we can all agree that both of these files are completely separate and have nothing to do with each other. Let's try compiling them to an object file. I'm using clang here, but the same process is true for any compiler and any operating system. C compilers normally start the linking process themselves after compilation is done, which for clang and GCC we can disable using the dash C flag. Okay, that worked. We got two separate object files. The natural question to ask is what these object files even contain? Well, they're binary, so we can't just open them up in a text editor. But what they contain is actual machine instructions, but along with that, a list of exported symbols. So what is a symbol? Well, anything that you can refer to by a name and has to be stored somewhere is normally a symbol. So. A function is a symbol, since the function code has to actually be stored somewhere. A struct or enum type isn't a symbol because it doesn't need storage itself. A variable of some struct and enum type, however, is a symbol because it actually is stored in memory, and so on. So, an object file is just a collection of exported symbols from the file. Some quick common terminology for you. The corresponding C files of these object files are also called compilation units. So main.c and foo.c are separate compilation units. Let's head back to our example files from before. They have one exported symbol each. Hello.c exports main, foo.c exports foo. Now let's invoke the linker. Clang uses the LLD linker by itself that comes with the LLVL toolchain. So I'll just invoke clang again with my object files this time. And there we go, we got an executable. Running it, we can get hello world printing as expected. Okay, this seems simple enough, but why am I saying that the distinction between compilation and linking is so important? Well, let's make a change to our example. Let's actually make use of our foo function that we declared and defined before by calling it in main instead of printing hello world directly. Now let's run the compiler and uh, oh, we get an error while compiling hello.c. Here's where us using the compilation command separately for each file directly helps our understanding. Taking a look at our hello.c file, how is the compiler supposed to know what foo is? We are only providing it with the hello.c name. so. It can't even look anywhere to check whether the function exists. So this makes sense. How do we solve this problem though? Well, we can do what is called a forward declaration. Basically, we just declare the prototype of the function 
right above our main function. And well, the prototype is damn simple. Now we can compile our hello.c file again, and this time it hasn't errored, even though the compiler didn't actually find code for the foo function. So why is that? The C compiler only goes from the top of the file to the bottom of the file once after pre-processing. So it will start stepping through from the top. When it gets to line 3, it will say, hey, this function is going to exist somewhere, so I'll remember the name and not complain when it's called. Stepping through a bit more, the compiler will land on the foo function call, remember line 3, and it will not complain. When the compiler outputs the .o file, any function call like this would just be kept dangling and unresolved. So basically, we've just tricked the compiler into outputting an object file with code that shouldn't actually work yet. This is where our linker steps in. When we invoke the linker, it will first build its own list of symbols based on the object files that it gets. Then it will go through all the code and look for these unresolved function calls. When it finds one, it will look up the symbol name in its list and if it finds a symbol, it will wire up the function call to the actual code and resolve the call. If it doesn't find the symbol, however, it will output the well-known unresolved external symbol error. This is quite a common error if you have tried using libraries in C. I know I struggled to understand it when I saw it the first time, but I hope this context makes things a bit clearer. Basically, the error means that the compiler saw a prototype for the function, but the linker failed to find the actual code that corresponds to that function. We can recreate this with our example. When running our final linking step, we can just omit passing the foo.o object file which contains the foo function symbol. And as you can see, we get that error, unresolved external symbol foo reference in function main. Since we know the difference between compilation and linking phases, we can easily say what went wrong. Let's move on to using libraries in C, because this understanding of the C compilation model gives us a new context to view how libraries are used. Normally, static libraries have the .lib extension or the .a extension depending on OS. So what exactly is in this file? Well, it's just a collection of many object files jammed into one single file. So it contains all the exported symbols from all the object files that are included in the lib file. In fact, we can circle around to our example before and convert our foo.c file into a library. There's absolutely zero reason for doing this, by the way. This is just for demonstration. The LLVM toolchain contains a tool for converting OBJs into libs with the LLVM AR command. And now we can use this library that it generated by using the dash L flag with clang. Notice here that we didn't have to pass in the foo.o object file itself. That's because it was a part of foo.lib. If I had n files compiling to n different object files, I could combine them easily into a single lib file and use it with the dash l flag. If you notice, by the way, I haven't said anything about header files in this whole video. Are they just irrelevant to see? The short answer to that is yes. The long answer is that they are largely unnecessary if you know all the function prototypes and types and everything else. Now, this is obviously not possible to do for large libraries, which is why library authors have header files which contain all the function prototypes and types that a compiler would need to know about during compilation. You can use them by just doing a hash include, which is just a textual copy paste. So, from all this info, we now know that to use a static library, all we have to do is put the library headers in an accessible spot and to link with the library using the dash l flag. There's actually another type of library in compiled languages, and that is a dynamic library. They have a different extension, .dll or .so based on DOS, but I'll use .dll in this example since I'm on Windows. These are quite different from static libraries because firstly, they are actually already linked. Let's try to build a DLL from our foo.c file. 
we have to use the dash shared flag for this. Clang will invoke the linker here and output a built DLL. The only differences between a DLL and an executable is 1. A DLL doesn't require a main function like an executable does and 2. A DLL also exports the, its own symbols. What this means is you can load symbols from a DLL at runtime. This is quite useful for a few reasons. 1. With static libraries, all the code gets jammed into your executable file, which can make your exe quite large. DLLs can be a way to split it up, though this isn't really a big deal normally. The win comes when you, there is more than one executable that might want to use the same code, in which case a DLL is useful to reduce code duplication. Another benefit is DLLs can act as plugins, where you can get all DLLs in a directory and load symbols from them. How exactly do DLLs work though? Well, you have to keep in mind that your computer is executing code that is literally just a stream of bytes. Your functions are compiling down to just bytes, which have to be stored somewhere. And that somewhere is your RAM. You can load a DLL using load library or DLopen depending on your OS, which will load the DLL code to your RAM. Well, not exactly. It actually maps your DLL to virtual address space, but that's a discussion for a completely different video. For all intents and purposes, it's just loading it into RAM. From there, you can ask the loaded DLL for a procedure, that is a function using get proc address or DLSIM. Again, depending on OS. This will return you an address to the function that you asked for, which you can store and call whenever you want. Once you're done with using the DLL, you can release the DLL by using free library or DL close. Let's try this with our hello.c file. This stuff is a bit advanced, so don't worry if you don't understand some of it. First of all, a forward declaration won't do anything since the linker is never going to find the foo function at link time. This stuff is going to shift to runtime. So instead, we turn this into a type def. So now the name foo underscore t has this type. This type doesn't actually have any storage, so you can't make a variable with this type. However, you can make a variable which has the type which is a pointer to foo underscore t, commonly known as a function pointer. These have a very cursed syntax normally if you try type defining the function pointer directly, so I think it's just better to define the function type separately and then use a star to declare a function pointer variable separately. So let's declare a global variable of type foo underscore t star and call it foo and initialize it to zero as the default state. Now for the loading. I'll have to include windows.h, but on Nix-based OSs, you'd have to include dlsim.h and use the analogous functions I showed before. So we can load library or dlopen the foo.dll and use get proc address to get the foo function and assign it to our foo variable. We have to cast here because by default, the function pointer type is something different. And it's just a placeholder type. Since both the return type and our required type are pointers, casting won't give you any errors. Now that we have our foo function loaded, we can simply call it. An additional error check would make sure foo isn't a null pointer because the function wasn't found in the DLL, but we won't do that here. Only after using any symbols or functions from the DLL can we free the DLL, since once we free it, we can't access any symbols from it. Now, compiling our foo.c file to an object file, there's no errors, and we can just compile our single hello.o object file to an executable without any additional object files or libs. And that just works. Making sure the foo.dll is there in the same folder, we can run the executable and the seg fault. So what happened? Well, the linker didn't actually export the symbols that we wanted it to export. We actually need to explicitly tell the linker to export our foo function. We can do this by using the decl spec dll export for clang or attribute dll export for gcc.
yes, it looks very ugly and is completely compiler specific, but whatever. Let's just put it on the foo function. And yep, it worked, but why did it create a lib file and an exp file? What are those for? I'll get back to that in just a bit, but you can ignore these for now. Running our exe, we get a hello world. Nice, so we loaded a DLL and got a function from it, and called the function. There's another way to load functions, which uses those lib files that Clang generated. Instead of using OS specific functions for loading the DLL and the function ourselves, the lib file can do that for us. These types of lib files are called loader libs. To use them, we can add the dash l flag again with the lib file and revert to our old forward declaration method. But this time, we have to use underscore underscore decl spec dll import for clang or attribute dll import for gcc on the forward declaration. The functions are still loaded at runtime, but we don't have to load the functions ourselves with OS specific calls. Barring this dynamic library stuff, which just takes some working with to understand, I think we can all agree that the compilation process is dead simple, and understanding it deeper actually does help our understanding of using libraries and having a good project structure. But that's all for today. Thanks for watching and see you next time.